Hello and welcome to this flip preaching video. My name's Andy. We're going to have a look at the passage for Sunday and unpick it a bit before we get there. So um, this week we're looking at Luke. We haven't looked at Luke for a while, but because Luke has one of the great kind of Easter resurrection stories, we, we're going to switch back into Luke from, from our normal pattern of looking through Matthew this year. So it's Luke 24, 13 to 35. Um, if you, I recommend you get the sheet because I've laid it out in a particular way which I'll explain in a minute and there's a space at the top for you to highlight three different themes which we'll be thinking about today. So we're going to think about the themes in this story of grumpiness, travel and revelation. Grumpiness, travel and revelation, that's what you need to find in the Bible. So um, it's the story of, it's the same day as the the resurrection just towards the evening and we get these two people who are traveling away from Jerusalem to um, the place they were staying in a, a village called Emmaus and lo and behold Jesus appears to them on the way but they don't recognize him and they invite him into their home for tea uh, Jesus breaks some bread they do recognize him Jesus vanishes and then these two people go back to Jerusalem to tell the other tell the disciples. So it's a very strange story, but it's very, very carefully put together. So um, the, the way I've laid out the sheet is um, I've indented different bits of it. So different bits are kind of moved in. So it makes like a kind of pyramid structure. And um, this is something which the, the Bible writers do again and again and again. It was a very common thing back then to do this. Um, we don't do it in English these days, so we've kind of lost our sensitivity to this, but this is very clear. It's called a chiasm. So this is called a chiastic structure. And what happens is each step of the pyramid or each step of the staircase, which goes up and then down again, is kind of parallel. So to start with, the first chunk is all about them walking away from Jerusalem. The last chunk is about them walking back to Jerusalem. Okay, second step. The first bit, their eyes were closed, kept from recognising the, the last bit, their eyes were opened. Okay, moving in one. Um, there's talk about walking along, chatting with Jesus, and both of those. Next one, um, it talks about the things. So it talks about the story. On the first one, they give their version of it. And on the second, afterwards, Jesus gives his version of accounts. Then they talk about the women astounding them. And then they say the women uh, said something that they didn't quite believe it. So it's about the women witnessing the resurrection of the tomb. Then there's the thing about the tomb itself, and before and after. But then we get this bit right in the middle. They always have an odd number of steps. So there's one thing which has no parallel. And that's the bit which is the focus. That's the bit which the story's wanting us to see. So the focal point of this is they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. So that's the heart of the whole story, if you like, that Jesus is alive. That's really what this is carefully, very carefully structured to, to point out that Jesus is alive. But we're gonna have a look at some of the other bits of this as well, because I think they're quite interesting. Um, firstly, the, the people who were walking along, we know the name of one of them, but not the other. Um, the people were in a bit of a grump, actually. We sometimes lose this when it gets translated into English. And we, we often romanticise this story as these two people having a lovely talk together and Jesus coming alongside and walking with them. And that kind of is there. But actually, they're in a real mood. They're, they're in a real grump. So some of the things that give us that idea, um, the, the language is really forceful in the original Greek. So in verse 16, when it says their eyes were kept from recognising him, that, that's like they were held captive, they were, they were held hostage, they were overpowered, their eyes were overpowered. In verse 17, the word we've got in this English translation is what are you discussing? But actually the original is more like what are you throwing around? They were, they were having an argument. It said they stood still looking sad. They were looking forlorn, angry. They were kind of at their wits end. They, the first thing they say to Jesus is really snarky. They don't realize it's Jesus, but 
Jesus comes alongside them. They don't get it. They don't realise who it is. And they answer really sarcastically. Are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened? You know, they, they, they kind of snap back. When it gets to verse 22, the bit about the women, um, there's a sense that they don't believe them. They, you know, the women at the tomb have seen the most amazing thing. They've seen the empty tomb. They've realised that Jesus is alive. And these two are just going off because they don't quite believe what the women are saying. There's a hint here of a kind of schism, a split in the early church, you know, day one of the early church. There, there's a bit of a split between what the women say and what these guys think. Then in verse 25, Jesus speaks back to them and he's really harsh. <laughs> Jesus is really blunt with them. Um, he says, you're foolish, you're stupid, you're slow in heart. Why don't you get it? Um, he's, he, no, he's, really, he's really no holds barred. He really lets rip at them. Um, often the case that when Jesus... Jesus appears to people in the resurrection stories. He's completely gracious and gentle and forgiving. But here, he does kind of let rip. And I wonder whether they kind of needed the equivalent of a slap round the face to get them to get them back. I wonder if they were so deep in their grump they needed a bit of straight talking. And they certainly got it. Jesus calls them stupid, slow in heart, um, unable to see. And it does kind of kick them out of their of their stupor. Um, and the harshness kind of goes on in verse 28. Jesus kind of pretends that he's going further, but they says they urged him strongly to stay with them. That's again a very forceful. They almost they almost trapped him down, pinned him down. So there's a lot of grumpiness in this story. There's a lot of high anxiety, a lot of um, a lot of high emotions. Okay, second thing is travel. Um, travel's really, really important to Luke. Almost all the major things that happen in Luke's Gospel happen when people are going from one place to another, on the road. At the very end of it, in the, the last sort of closing bit, they, we get this road, pardon me, this word road twice, and it's a loaded word. Um, the word road um, means the way, which is what Christianity was called before it was called Christianity. So. The fact these people are walking on a road and they get back on a road, that's symbolic of Christianity as, as a whole. In, in Luke, it's all about travelling and finding things out gradually, slowly on the way. At the start of it, they're travelling away from Jerusalem. All throughout Luke's Gospel, Jesus, when I mean, he starts in Jerusalem with his kind of that story about him as a boy going to the temple, but all the way through the gospel, he starts off, you know, in the far north in Galilee, and he gradually gets closer and closer to Jerusalem, gets there for the Easter story. And here, the people are starting to take the message out. And the book of Acts, which is written by the same person and is like part two, volume two, um, is about them travelling away from Jerusalem, taking the message out again. So we've got a bit of a hint here that the, we've come to the pinnacle in Jerusalem, a bit like the pinnacle in this story, where we find that Jesus is alive there, and then they're starting to go outwards. The third thing is about revelation. I want to talk about how the people see God in this. So the, Jesus appears to these two people, and they don't get it. They don't realise who he is. He says their eyes, eyes are overpowered, their eyes are kept from seeing him. Eventually, when they go to they go to dinner. Jesus, somewhat unusually, this this mysterious person has been travelling with them, who they've invited into their home. He takes over as the host. He's the one who takes the bread, and he it, it says he where are we? Um, he he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it. These are the same words, almost exactly as when he he fed them with the 5,000 others um, earlier in the story of Luke, Luke 9, 16. Very similar words. So the idea of the bread being broken and blessed and shared. Suddenly it says their eyes were opened. They, they saw. But then Jesus vanished. It says he, he became invisible to them. 
I don't understand what this is. There's perhaps something in this about that when we we occasionally we're we're granted a glimpse of God, but it's always very fleeting. Um, Jesus didn't stay around with them for them to kind of talk to him and pin him down. He as soon as they as soon as they realised he'd he vanished from their sight, but not from their hearts. Um, the heart's really important in this as well. Jesus, remember, criticised them for having slow hearts. But at the end, they admit, were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking, us, talking to us on the road? So actually, Jesus was being revealed to them in their hearts as they went. They didn't get to see until the very end, but they, they had something going on inside them. And that stayed with them, um, presumably forever. It says as well, were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. There's a real sense here that the record of God's work through the Bible, through the Old Testament and the New Testament, they're, they're a record of how God has appeared in this world. They're our, they're our prime source of revelation. And they had, a, they had a misunderstanding of it, which Jesus kind of recorrected. But there's a real sense that although Jesus has vanished from sight, from them and from us, we still get the old record. We can still look back to what God has done, knowing that that's the same God today, even though invisible to us. So the thing, to finish with this, the thing that they had got wrong um, was because, let me find this, it's in verse... Oh, I should have checked this earlier, I can't see it in my own notes. Um, there we are, verse 21. They said that we had hoped that they say that Jesus, you know, they, they said that Jesus was doing really good things. He was a, a prophet. He did mighty things in word and deed. But they said, but, 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 but we were hoping he would redeem Israel. They were hoping that he would set the people in, in Jerusalem free from Roman occupation. They were expecting like a military dramatic. They were expecting something amazing. They were expecting like a you know, God to come in in a chariot and to kill all the Romans and, and set them free. But Jesus says in his interpretation, in the parallel part, around about verse 26, he says, no, that's not what the scriptures have said. The scriptures have said all along that the Messiah should suffer. The people, Cleopas and his friend, we're expecting a far more miraculous, triumphant God than the one that appeared. And Jesus was saying that this is something that's been happening all along. God had been suffering along with us all throughout history. God is a God who suffers alongside us and sets us free through suffering and death, not a kind of mighty God who, who slays enemies. That's not the God that is revealed in the Easter story, that's revealed in the person of Jesus and in this story here. Oh, by the way, the women of the tomb were right. He is alive. Okay, thanks for, thanks for joining me. I wonder what you think about this. Brilliant story. Okay, thanks for watching. Cheerio. Bye-bye.